This is on assignment. Hi, I'm Alex Villarreal here with Imran Siddiqui, and we are on assignment at Washington's National Cherry Blossom Festival. The cherry blossom trees were a gift from Japan exactly 100 years ago. But this month marks another Sambun anniversary for Japan. It's been one year since that devastating earthquake and tsunami. In this episode, we'll go inside Japan for the anniversary and hear from our correspondent at the forefront of the disaster. We'll also hear about this vital video, Kony 2012. One of our correspondents is covering it. He's going to talk about that too. You'll meet two hosts of VOA's Diwa Radio, which can now be seen on television in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And later on in the show, believe it or not, we're going to find out if someone's fighting over George Washington's old church. These are the stories behind the stories, so stay with us as we go on assignment. March 11, 2011, a deadly magnitude 9 earthquake hits Japan. A quake so powerful, it actually shifts the Earth's axis. The quake sets off a devastating tsunami that spawns one of the worst nuclear disasters in history. The effects are still being felt today. Alex talked with a reporter in the region. It has been one year since the deadly earthquake and tsunami that triggered the crisis at Japan's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. VOA's Steve Herman was one of the first journalists to reach the gates of the plant after the disaster struck, and he has been following the crisis ever since. Steve joins us now via Skype. Steve, can you tell us where you are right now and talk to us about some of the radiation concerns that, that still persist? I'm in Koreyama in Fukushima Prefecture. That's about uh, 40 kilometers from the um, front gate of the uh, Fukushima number one nuclear power plant. And uh, this is where I was uh, initially on March uh, 12th, the day after the earthquake and tsunami hit the coast of northeastern Japan. Um, and uh, they have brought uh, the reactors uh, to a state, they say, of a cold shutdown, although some other experts uh, dispute that and it's still a very precarious situation at the plant and it will take years, probably decades, before it is totally stabilized. What about the surrounding areas, the, the towns uh, near the plant? What's the, what's the status in, in those towns? Have people gone back? Well, there is still a 20 kilometer uh, no-go zone. Uh, we went uh, yesterday to the very edge of that, as close as we could get. The police will not let us in. Only uh, certain official vehicles can go in there. Although there are a few people still living inside the no-go zone. And there's hopes that uh, more people will come back. One community we were visiting uh, called Kawauchi, only um, a few hundred people out of 3,000 residents have returned. The mayor wants more people to come back, but they say they're afraid because of the radiation. Although ironically, what we discovered was that some of the uh, radiation levels inside the no-go zone are actually lower than outside the zone. So having this uh, sort of semicircle 20 kilometer radius to a lot of people in the area doesn't make a lot of sense. What are some of the other lingering problems that we've seen from this uh, event? You know, I know you, you have talked about the power company facing pretty serious fallout. Right. Well, there's a question of whether the T Tokyo Electric Power Company will survive as an independent entity. It is a publicly traded corporation. There's a lot of talk about the government taking it over. The big problems in the area, I, I think, are, are, are threefold. One is uh, communities have not been rebuilt yet. Uh, they, there's, there's frustration with the slow pace of, of rebuilding. A lot of the rubble hasn't been cleared and there's no place to take it. One of the biggest challenges facing northeastern Japan is what to do with these accumulating mountains of debris and rubble from the earthquake and tsunami known as Gareki. Authorities estimate there will eventually be 2.2 million tons of Gareki, everything from smashed vehicles to piles and piles of clothing. Yet something else to worry about are the frequent aftershocks continuing to rattle the region, forcing jittery survivors to relive that awful day. And a third problem is agriculture. This area here, Fukushima Prefecture, is perhaps the richest rice growing area in Japan and the second largest on the Japanese mainland. And it's a tremendous agricultural area, or it was until March 11th of last year. A lot of the crops uh, were 
they can't be sold because people fear they're contaminated or they've been taken off the market because some uh, produce has tested uh, above the uh, legal limits for radiation. The farmers uh, can't grow their crops, can't sell them. Uh, cattlemen can't uh, even uh, take their cows out to pasture. In terms of, of the loss that the, the Japanese people, that they, they've been through, through the, the earthquake and, and tsunami, how, do you, how have you seen now, a year later, how is Japan healing from this? Well, we, we have to take into consideration that 20,000 people died that day. Some families don't have closure because the bodies haven't been found, and many of them probably will never be found because they were washed out to sea with the tsunami. So there is still a somber mood, but uh, a lot of people are getting on with life. But the, the, the Japanese in, in general are not, uh, are not complainers. Also, another very significant change we've seen since last year is a spirit of volunteerism that we really haven't seen before in Japan. People may have helped out in their own local neighborhood, but to have people go from other parts of Japan uh, up into these areas here for extended period of time and, and really help out, that, that is really something remarkable. Well, Steve, we thank you so much for all of your efforts in bringing us these stories and for getting out there um, and showing us what's going on. So again, thank you, Steve Herman, uh, reporting to us from Fukushima Prefecture. We're going to take a short break now, but stay with us because coming up... We take a look at what's being called the fastest growing viral video in history. You're watching On Assignment. VOA reporters are at work finding stories from around the world. For example, VOA's Stephanie Ho recently met Chinese photographer Hu Chengwei, who's turning his camera away from cities and toward villages, documenting the changing Chinese countryside. He Chongyue's camera captures portraits of some of the people China's rapid modernization has left behind, especially the people he calls the last true peasants. Why do I say that? Because afterwards there won't be many people left who are fully farmers. These people's children are all working in the cities. They're not city people, but they aren't villagers anymore either. He says these people sacrificed the most in the early decades of communist China, but still have only one basic demand, having enough to eat. There's an interesting story behind this place. You see this man, the clothes he's wearing? His home is probably a very poor one. His clothes were very dirty. He brought his household registration book with him, and he asked me, where should I go to get the money? I thought you were here to give us money. He points to another social problem that his photos illustrate. In the beginning, I didn't want kids to be in the pictures. I wanted only old people. But then the old people are the ones who took care of the children at home. So once they go out of the house, the kids go with them. Photos are ubiquitous these days, but He says he feels it is his responsibility to record images that people do not commonly see. He rejects using gimmicks to alter his photos and says he wants to record real life. He says he hopes his work helps highlight the plight of people who may otherwise be forgotten. Stephanie Ho, VOA News, Beijing. I don't know, Alex, if you watched it, but tens of millions of people have watched it, and I'm talking about Kony 2012, a film by advocacy group Invisible Children that's gone viral. I actually did see it, Imran. This video's aim is to increase pressure for the capture of Ugandan warlord Joseph Kony, and I got the story from former VOA Africa reporter Nico Columbus. Nico, what is all the buzz on this film about? So the buzz is basically that it's the fastest growing internet video ever. Humanity's greatest desire is to belong and connect. Tens of millions of people have watched it, and it's a social media movement unlike any other before. And what it's done is it's uh, gotten a lot of people to find out about the LRA leader, Joseph Kony. This movie expires on December 31st, 2012 and its only purpose is to stop the rebel group, the LRA, and their leader, Joseph Kony. What did Invisible Children do to generate this kind of response? 
they created not only a video, but they created a social media movement, which they had already uh, prepared the ground for before. And uh, what they did is they used high school students to be the people promoting the video. Who are you to end a war? I'm here to tell you, who are you not to? And their awareness turned into action. We started something, a community. All of this was funded by an army of young people. So it's a video that creates a movement. And now all these young people, they were in the movie. When the movie was being released on the internet, they all used their own social media to promote it. The movie also had 20 or so big time celebrities behind the project. They also used their own social media to promote it. And then it created this huge snowball effect. I'd like the indicted war criminals to enjoy the same level of celebrity as me. We're all doing this for the exact same reason and we're all coming from completely different places. This is what the world should be like. He's an extraordinarily horrible human being who, who uh, you know, his time has come. And it's lovely to see that young people are raising up as well. So Joseph Kony is the leader of the Lord's Resistance Army. It started out as a rebel movement uh, against Uganda's government because there had been uh, repression against the Acholi people from northern Uganda. He is from that group. He started as a rebel leader. Then, after a while, he became funded uh, by Sudan's government because there was a civil war in Sudan and Uganda's government was backing South Sudanese rebel forces. And Sudan, as a countermeasure, started backing uh, Joseph Kony. So he got a lot of money uh, that way. Now, his tactics became more and more horrific, more and more brutal. My brother tried to escape. Then they came using panga. They cut his neck. Did you see it? I saw. What uh, Joseph Kony has done over the years is that he abducts children and turns them into uh, sexual slaves or child soldiers. Uh, a lot of times also he will maim victims as a psychological technique to keep them alive, but to maim them to show that he has been there. And he forces them to kill their own parents. There has been some criticism of this film, Coney 2012. What has bothered people about it? What's bothered people is that it's sort of an American perspective about an African problem. And the hero of the film is an American filmmaker. The main heroes of the film besides him are U.S. high school students and his own uh, small son. So it's, it seems to some that it's exploiting sort of an issue for a gain for an American audience. And some people even went as far as saying that it's exploiting American high school students by, you know, making them donate to this cause by, you know, using a strategy that will appeal to them. You mentioned Sudan. Uh, we saw some interesting action with activism on the Sudanese issue this week. Can you talk to us about that? It's an interesting thing where these U.S. groups, which combines celebrities, social media savvy companies, uh, lobbyists, evangelicals, all care very deeply about the LRA and Sudan. And for some reason, it's been their go-to projects for the last 10, 15 years. It's very valid. Their point is that it doesn't get much coverage in mass media. It does get coverage, but their point is that this is the project that uh, they're working on and they want to denounce the abuses that are still going on. There was very dramatic video of George Clooney being arrested. Um, what do you know about, about what happened? George Clooney, he was just in uh, those border regions of Sudan. He, uh, he's been testifying since he got back in Washington. He wanted to, to get arrested, and that was part of his plan. All the media cameras were there. They're not in the Nuba Mountains where the hostilities are taking place, but they're certainly there when George Clooney gets arrested in Washington. But what these people are trying to do is to, to wake up people to these types of atrocities still taking place. Again, this is VOA's Nico Columbant, former VOA correspondent in Africa and following African issues for us now. Thank you. Since we taped that segment, Coney 2012 filmmaker and Invisible Children co-founder Jason Russell was taken into police custody after allegedly running naked through a California neighborhood, yelling incoherently and pounding his fists on the sidewalk. He was hospitalized after the March 15th incident. Invisible Children issued a statement saying Russell was suffering from exhaustion 
dehydration and malnutrition. His wife says he was under stress and had taken attacks against the film very hard. And now, a behind-the-scenes look at a VOA program bringing world news to the tribal regions of northern Pakistan. You are on assignment. Tasu, the America Hug. You are radio Khan, Voice of America, Diva Radio, Islamabad. And I'm standing here with Iftikhar Hussain and Iram Shahzad from Diva Radio. They just launched a new satellite show, which is satellite, but it's kind of radio at the same time. Iftikhar, what is so unique about the show? The first uniqueness is radio on TV. It's a kind of multimedia product reaching out to the region, to our audience in a different way. And uh, it brings uh, all the important issues, right from politics to entertainment, uh, music, uh, human rights, literature, each and everything uh, to, to the region, to our audience. When we talk about the audience, your audience in the Pakistan border region, how important do you think they are? They are very much important uh, because uh, we, we do the shows for them. All those stories and reports which are just reflecting their problems and issues and their social and personal lives. To her point, as she uh, pointed out, um, the region is not uh, reflected in the mainstream media of Pakistan. So Diva Radio is the only international Pashto broadcast reaching out to those who are on the peripheries and on the margins of the Pakistan mainstream media and they want to know about their issues, they want to know about solutions and they want to know about prospectives from around the world. So Diva Radio is the place which offers them and they are very important to us. You know the first impression from a lot of people that I've gotten is that uh, people in that part of the world might not have access to internet or might not know how to use social media, but you guys are using social media for this. This is one of the way to reach out to the to youth and also to the urban population who could see us on television. But in Pakistan, it's an increasingly youth population, more than the official say what we hear, more than 60%. And in Pakistan, the official figure also said that there are more mobile telephone users than its voters. So it gives you the best chance to reach out to them through TV and multimedia. So we have Facebook, uh, we have Twitter, Twitter. We, we, we put our shows on YouTube, exactly. we have a vibrant website where they can put their views and they can ask things and they can read uh, our news. It's a, it's, it's a very plus point for us that uh, a great number of people and the young people uh, they even appreciated this show and, and uh, also uh, we have a youth separate show on our radio yeah. um, uh, which discusses the issues of youth and bring them uh, into focus and we have a wonderful host for them uh, Mujib and, and Mawash yeah. and uh, in the media uh, for a long time there have been uh, much talk about the youth but they have not been represented in the media. So Diva Radio is the platform which exactly. is giving them space to, 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 to discuss their problems. What about your audience feedback? I, I heard that the audience is loving your show. They're loving it, they're just crazy about it. Now they have the clear imaginations that how we look. In radio, as you know that uh, sometimes you can do like this, you can be like this, but on TV, yeah. you have to be very much like uh, active and you should be like this and you give up solid expressions. I should be choosing different shots. Nowadays we are working in, uh, in, in, in the field of war. You, you can see the situation nowadays in Pakistan. So in a very sensitive uh, era and in a time we are working on it. As you know that one of our uh, stringer, uh, Mukaram Khan Atif, he has been uh, shoot killed by uh, some unknown people. And uh, even right now, uh, th those people who are working from the region for us, they have the life threats. Even we people who yeah. are working from the Washington DC, uh, from here, so we have the life threats. I watch your show and my uh, regrets for what happened with our, our colleague and, and former uh, journalist. And I wish you guys all the best and uh, they can catch you where? www.voadivaradio.com There you have it. You can watch them on Dish and you can watch them on voadivaradio.com. Iftikhar Hussain and Iram Shahzad of Diva Radio, you're on assignment. Thank you very much. Thanks. Done. Thanks. <laughs> well, Imran, looks like it's time for another break. Next up, Imran talks to VOA's religion reporter about a dispute involving George Washington's old church. You're watching On Assignment. 
que es el... Transmitters on. It started on the radio. This is a voice speaking from America. VOA is now a multimedia machine. It's a new world, moving fast, and Voice of America is keeping pace. iPhones are cameras, iPads are teleprompters. Skype me an interview, text me your story, tweet a line, Facebook an idea, HDTV anyone? Check out the newsroom. We've done a several joint projects with our colleagues from Urdu and, and from PNN. El presidente Barack Obama visitó. VOA is everywhere. En serio, yo creo que tú eres. In 43 languages, with news and information to 141 million people a week. From the uprising in Syria to the U.S. Republican primaries, VOA is there. We've got a great conservative track record. A great victory in Arizona tonight. The war in Afghanistan and what the U.S. plans ahead. Andre Dinesner getting the inside scoop with a one-on-one -on -one with President Obama. President Karzai, I think, has the same strategic interests that we have. The innovation continues on VOA Persian with Perspectives, a bilingual interview show hosted by one of VOA's most recognizable personalities. He told me about a project his company has been working on. And finally, TV viewers in Iran have been delighted by VOA's satirical take on Iranian politics called Parazit. Parazit means static in English. But VOA is anything but static. We're changing and moving forward to another 70 years. Outside the nation's capital stands a church where George Washington prayed and served as a vestryman or lay leader. This is Falls Church. It was founded in 1732 before there even was an Episcopal church. Six years ago, the congregation voted overwhelmingly to leave the Episcopal umbrella, and that led to a dispute over the ownership of this historic property. The decision was made after Gene Robinson, an openly gay man, was consecrated as an Episcopal bishop. The Episcopal Church is part of the worldwide Anglican Communion, and Falls Church was one of many congregations that broke from the U.S. Church by aligning themselves with conservative Anglican provinces in Africa and South America. Jerome, why did you choose this particular story? This church had had uh, some troubles over having consecrated a gay bishop. Uh, they were fighting about property with congregations that were deciding to break away. And this uh, Falls Church was one of those congregations that was involved in one of those property disputes. The Reverend John Yates says there were broad disagreements over scripture. We were seeing a growing increase in the leadership of the church represented by people who no longer believed as we believed. But under presiding bishop Catherine Jeffords Shorey, the National Episcopal Church won a court battle over ownership of the property. This congregation now has until April 30th to move out of the old church and its new prayer hall. When you talk about reporting on religion within the United States, do you think this is the last frontier when we talk about diversity of faith? In many ways it is. I mean, this country was founded by people fleeing persecution in Europe, uh, fleeing that old style religion where religion was, had a monopolistic position in a country. And here you don't have that, and that's, that freedom of religion here has led to many new variants of, of uh, that faith. And so there's a, there's a remarkable fluidity to religion here. You have so many people uh, converting to other faiths, marrying people of other faiths. Melanie Mullen grew up going to a Presbyterian church every Sunday, but later drifted away. I had a hard time thinking of a guy that didn't like my gay and lesbian friends. And that's what drew her here. The idea that the Episcopal Church was in scandal, um, taking a stand for gay rights, was actually appealing to me and to a lot of my friends. Religion professor David Rusin has tracked the overall decline of mainline Protestant churches. He says that the Episcopal split was actually a good thing. So much energy was going into fighting each other. Ironically, America was founded on this idea of separating church from state, what we call disestablishment, having no official religion. One might think that that would actually lead to a weakening of faith 
in this country, that America should be the most secular nation on earth, when it seems like the opposite is true, that that has actually led to a very vibrant kind of faith, um, perhaps as a result of a competition that, that people need, churches need to work harder to draw people into the pews. And so you actually end up with Europe where you have had state churches for a long time where their church attendance is dropping to very low levels or has dropped in recent decades, and America where, where it's quite high for an industrialized country. Well, I wish you good luck uh, for your future projects. Thank you for joining us. I wish that we get a chance to report together, a Muslim and a Jew uh, working together, maybe coming to your town soon. Jerome Sokolovsky, you can catch him on voanews.com. His beat is religion, and this is On Assignment. And now in our full story feature, how one organization is giving women in Afghanistan a safe place to connect to the world. VOA's Ahwan service attended the opening of the Ahwan capital's first ever women-only internet cafe. Wow. Arupande tells us about it. There is barely room to move as women crowd around laptop computers in the small cafe in central Kabul. The Afghan activist group Young Women for Change runs the cafe as a safe place where women can access the internet and exchange information without the unwanted attention of men. We are very pleased that we are inaugurating this cafe, which is located in a safe location and safe environment. This paves the way for women to come to our cafe and use our facilities. The brightly painted cafe is named after Sahar Gul, a teenage girl who gained international attention after police found her severely beaten in her husband's house in northern Baglan province. Gul accused her husband and in-laws of torturing her. We named this after Sahar Gul because she suffered a lot of atrocities, and we want to comment on her bravery. We want her to know that we are proud of her. Gul's case is not isolated in Afghanistan. During the 1990s, the ruling Taliban banned women from going to work, getting an education, or even leaving their homes without a male escort. Women's rights in Afghanistan have advanced since then, but activists say there is still room for improvement. For these Afghan women, this cafe with donated computers is one big step. Aru Pandey, VOA News, Washington. And that's our show. To see the full versions of all the stories we featured, head to voanews.com. And they can also check us out on Facebook and Twitter at VOA On Assignment. Don't miss next week's episode when we show you how Cambodia is healing more than three decades after the reign of the Khmer Rouge. From the VOA Newsroom in Washington, on behalf of Alex and myself and everyone else who worked on the program, this is On Assignment. <laughs>